a series called Made for Miracles. And the scripture says in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, search for the Lord and his strength. What a great statement that is in and of itself. Continually seek him. Remember his, the wonders he has performed, his miracles. And it's interesting that here the psalmist is asking us to stir up memories of miracles to raise faith, not just to tell good stories, but to raise our own faith, our own expectation. And we need to do that from time to time because we feel the pressures of life and the things that just can become a weight on us. And I want to say to you that whatever situation you are facing, however challenging, it's made for a miracle, an opportunity for God to reveal himself to you, an opportunity for God's grace to intervene in your circumstance, an opportunity for God's glory. I want you to catch that, an opportunity for God to reveal himself in a really special way to you, an opportunity for God's grace to be poured out into your circumstance, and an opportunity that will give God glory. Because the first thing you need for a miracle and this is the bit we don't like, is a problem. If you don't have a problem, you don't need a miracle. But if you've got a problem, you've qualified for a miracle. And problems and pain are areas that we don't like to habitate. We don't like to dwell there. We throw everything in our society to make our lives as comfortable as possible, and I'm thankful for it. But we still face problems. We still encounter pain, whether it's out of relationships, illness, financial hardship, whatever the case may be, something else that's going on in your world. And problems and pain are areas we don't want to frequent. But it's in that very situation that you qualify for a miracle. In John 9 and verse 1, Jesus is passing by, and I love that. And as he, that is Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus gives an answer, but his response is, neither, you've got it wrong completely. And he says, this is an opportunity for God's glory. This is an opportunity for the works of God to be displayed in the circumstance. And I want to catch something there. Whenever we have a problem, a crisis, a circumstance that is beyond our control, we look to blame something or someone. And that's where the disciples go. Is it his fault? Is it his parents' fault? Is it somebody else's fault? And earlier in this passage, because John's dealing with a blind man, and it's connected to an incredible statement of Jesus, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And when we look for cause and blame for the pain that is in our world, Jesus, the light of the world, says, don't fix blame. Let me bring grace. He brings grace into that situation. He rejects the blame game thing. And he said, this man's hurting is preparation for his healing. This man's pain is preparation for a miracle to take place. And God will be glorified. And I would encourage, yeah, if there's something clear that's sinful, that you need to repent of, bring it before God. But don't attach blame and punishment to it. Look for God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy in that situation. But I want to come to a passage and just unpack a few thoughts about a miracle that Jesus did that I think is quite extraordinary. In fact, all these miracles were. But this is one of those that kind of almost gets forgotten. It gets overlooked. And it's found in John's Gospel chapter 4, and Jesus is traveling from Jerusalem back up into the region of Galilee and the Sea of Galilee. He's passing up through the Perean Valley. He's gone uh, Samaria, and he's encountered the Samaritan woman. And it says that he sent, sorry, in Psalm 107 verse 20, and this is to me the thing that connects this miracle to something great that God said in the Old Testament in the Psalms. 
that God sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction, the pits where they were trapped is what that destruction means. The pits where they were trapped. It can also mean the grave or they were close to death. But I, I like that concept, the broader thing in the Hebrew, the pits where they were trapped. And sometimes we feel like we're trapped in a pit, in a hole as it were. And Jesus healed three people from a distance, the centurion servant, a demonized girl, and this story, the nobleman's son. And the first thing we want to notice is that he received a welcome, but without honor. Let's read the passage in John 4, verse 43 and following. After two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself has testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. He's heading up to Cana in the Jezreel Valley near Nazareth where he comes from. It's hometown territory for him. And so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. You go, but they welcomed him. And yet Jesus says, when I go back here, a prophet will not receive honor from his own hometown. And what I'm wanting to highlight here, I think what John's trying to highlight here, is that you can welcome Jesus as some kind of magician. They had seen him perform miracles in Jerusalem, and they're kind of excited. Another show, the traveling healers come to town, get everybody, you should see the stuff he does. But they failed to recognize him and honor him for he really is. God made manifest in the flesh. And the Galileans were more interested in the signs and wonders than in who Jesus actually was. And I've got to just pose this question. Do you want the miracle, and it's not wrong to say, yeah, I'd love the miracle, but you want the miracle more than you want the miracle worker. And if you get the miracle worker, you get the miracle. But it's a welcome with honor rather than a welcome without honor. And Jesus then challenges them. And it's kind of random. He says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He's again going to this thing. You just want a performance. And it's familiarity that causes dishonor. When Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, they received and said, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? And they scoffed at him. Somebody said, oh, isn't he Jesus? He he grew up here. He's the carpenter's son. He's the son of Mary. Remember that weird story? And they were offended him. And the Bible says because of that, he could do no great miracles there. But into this situation comes somebody with an incredibly desperate need. And to stir our faith, John tells us, Jesus is at Cana where he performed his first miracle, but he can do more than just one miracle. And he came to Cana in Galilee, where he'd made water into wine. And at Capernaum, which is two days walking distance from Cana, across a mountain range, a passed near the Arbel Cliffs. At Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to ask him to come down and heal his son, for he was at a point of death. Now, I want to just catch something out. I can't take too much time on it. But it's two days walking distance from Cana to Capernaum. Two days going back. It's worth remembering this in the story. So Jesus has been in Cana for a while. Somebody has walked back, no phones, no landlines, nothing. They walked back and said, Jesus is up in the Galilee region in, near Canaan. And this man's son is sick. He says, I need him. He walks two days to go and ask Jesus to come and heal his son. And it's a desperate need. When this man heard that Jesus had come to Judea of Galilee, he went to him, two days journey. So he's heard this. It's about a 32-kilometer walk. There's about a, a rise, a cliff that you have to, or, or a 
pass that you have to walk through and that, that rises about 500 meters, two days' journey and far. And Capernaum is near Tiberias, and I'm just trying to put a context to who this man is. This Tiberius is Herod Antipas, whom Jesus calls the fox, the man who had married his brother's wife, and John the Baptist had called him out on it, and John eventually had him executed. It's that Herod. There's a lot of Herod. It gets complicated, but it's that Herod. Desperate need, two days walking. But he has what I'll call an unstoppable faith. This royal official had probably seen Jesus do a miracle at Capernaum. He's desperate. He works for Herod Antipas, but his heart's been touched by Jesus earlier. He knows that Jesus can heal his son based on the miracles he's seen. And his faith sustained him on a two-day journey to go and find Jesus. And he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son. Some translations say he asked him, but the word is actually to plead, to beg, to appeal. It's a strong, please, please, my son is near death. He entreated him. And the simple thing that I just say, sometimes when you're looking for a miracle, you can't take no for an answer. Sometimes there's a delay. Sometimes God's up to something else, but there's constant. And it's not like you're nagging God into anything. Jesus told a parable to the effect that they should always pray and not lose heart about an unjust judge and a widow woman who just wouldn't let go of the issue. And eventually in exasperation, this man who didn't fear God, who didn't care for people said, I'm going to give her justice. And God's not comparing himself with this unjust judge. He said, if an unjust judge will listen to the plea, the prayer, how much more will your heavenly Father who loves you respond quickly to you? But will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he returns? And it's talking about, will we be persistent? Will we be um, just pushing to God and say, God, we want you. We want to see your miraculous in our world. Or will we become just faint-hearted in it? And in that parable, and I'm just going to throw this out because I need to move on, a picture of prayer works its way out. It's Luke 18. That prayer is beset with opposition and discouragement. That pleas sometimes seem to go unheard. And answers are sometimes delayed. And therefore, prayer is not for the faint-hearted. Prayer is an ongoing battle and ever present, and God invites us to come before him and bring our petitions, and that as a loving father, he responds. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 6 and verse 12, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. I say this with gentleness, but I'm speaking to my own heart as an encouragement. Have you become a little bit lazy in coming before God? Perhaps it is out of discouragement. Perhaps it is out of delay or what seems that you've gone unheard. But the writer says, don't do that. Don't do that. Imitate those who faith and patience. I wish it was faith and instant answers. I really do. But it's faith and patience by which we inherit the promise. And I want you to see, and this is really the the punch point of, of this message, this man's confident trust in Jesus. It, it, it was an unrelenting faith that brought him there. Two days journey, I believe if I can get hold of Jesus, he'll come down and he'll heal my son. But he moves to something else, to a confident trust. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus says, go, your son lives. Some translations say will live, but there's more imperative in the Greek. Your son lives. It's a command. He sends his word and instantly there's a response. And listen to what this man does. He's a royal official. He could have thrown his weight around. It says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. He's now going on another two-day journey 
living in a place of trust that what Jesus has said, go, your son lives, is happening. To me, it's one of the most extraordinary demonstrations of faith. He is literally walking in trust. And I think there's a difference between faith and trust, that they are close, but they're not the same. I think the difference is that trust is connected to a relationship. He's established a relationship with Jesus, and he knows he can trust him. Trust flows out of trustworthiness from another person. You go, I can trust them. They follow through on what they say. He places complete dependence on the character and the person of Jesus and his word. Go, your son lives. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And so he starts heading down. And at the very moment the son is healed, some servants come rushing to meet him, and they meet about halfway. They've each been on another day's journey before he gets the answer. And he asks, what time did it happen? And they said, give him the time. And it was the exact moment that Jesus said, go, your son lives. And he took Jesus at his word and departed. You can read that for yourself in John 4, 51 and following. I love this because I think this goes to help every single one of us, but particularly those who are connected to the life of the church through an online thing. You're not missing out when you come with worship and honor to Jesus because at a distance, he can send his word and heal you and deliver you out of the pits. He can heal you and deliver you and change your circumstance. But you come to him in faith with your plea, and you then trust his word, trust his character. Go, your son lives. And the man took Jesus at his word. Jesus healed at a distance, at a distance. And I use that in this, con- this concept of this message. He can do something extraordinary in your life. But it comes to, do you have a trusting relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you don't, it's such a simple step of faith. It's literally coming to him. Not not a two-day journey, but right now where you are, in your lounge room, in this auditorium, in the city hub, wherever it is, watching on delay, instantly in that moment, you can just come to him. I was talking to somebody just this last week about faith in Jesus, somebody who didn't have a church background. And I said, the amazing thing is that right now there's no religious behavior attached. It's simply an act of simple childlike faith that says, Jesus, if you're real, come into my life. It can be as as simple a prayer as that. And then you can ask questions and you can find things, but you will encounter the resurrected Christ in your circumstance. Mm -hmm.